Chapter 9, Dumb Gets Dumber. The gang and myself were finding trouble more and more exciting. I think we were all a bad match for each other. Along with the others who at any given time could have been Kevin, Ben, Ed, Boober, we all loved trouble. We would sometimes sneak out our windows late at night in the summer just for the sake of doing it. We didn't even need a reason other than, I guess, you're not supposed to be walking around town at 2 a.m. We might see an opportunity for trouble, we might not. Sometimes we invented trouble for no apparent reason. For example, one night Conrad, Kevin, and I snuck out late at night and decided to jump the fence at the local mom-and-pop lumber yard near my house. It was a tall chain link and we scaled it pretty easily. When we jumped the fence and snuck in, we knew there was no real purpose to it. Once we were inside the fence, we looked around in the dark for nothing specific. I guess we'll get an idea. Something will come to us. Aha! Pipes! Pipes! Awesome! Let's steal some. Yeah, let's do this. Let's steal a whole bunch. The pipes we came across were white PVC, fairly lightweight drain pipes. The PVC, polyvinyl chloride if you've ever wondered, were long in maybe 8 to 10 foot sections. We quietly pulled a bunch from the stack and carried them back to the fence under cover of the dark. The fence being tall, we pushed the pipe up over the fence to land in the only patch of grass we could see so when they hit the ground, they wouldn't make that much noise. We climbed back over the fence to the free world, threw our sections of pipe over our shoulders and hit the pavement. Boy did we score. Look at these big old pipes we stole. Now what are we going to do with all these pipes? We came up with a brilliant idea. We'll dump the pipes in my neighbor's pool and I guess they'll come outside tomorrow and see the pipes all sticking out of their pool. An absolute brilliant stroke of creative genius that I'm not sure who thought of, but I'll take credit for. But you know, just dumping the pipes in the pool is a little lackluster. Let's cannonball into the pool, then throw the pipes in and run. Maybe they'll wake up and come out. After executing some fine cannonball jumps into the pool, we laughed in hysterics as we threw the pipes in the pool. The neighbor's back porch light came on so fast, it was almost like someone was awake on guard duty. Instead of running away, we ducked into the hedges to see what was going to happen. The porch light went off and no one came out running. Oh man, what a letdown. Oh well, that was fun. Boy, those kids that are home in bed getting a good night's sleep for school tomorrow. What a bunch of fools. We really knew how to live. So the next day I woke up to the police at the door. Where did you get those pipes? Did you take them from the lumber yard? Um, no. What pipes? The pipes you dumped into their pool next door. They're extremely upset that you could have torn the lining in the pool. So you stole those pipes from the lumber yard? Um, no. You see, there are a couple of points to mention here. First of all, the lumber yard was directly across the train tracks from my house. A five minute walk at best. Where else would those stupid pipes come from in the middle of the night? Second, we never realized something that when we did something wrong, who the hell else would it be? Of course it was us. And last, here's where the forensics come into play. When we jumped out of the pool and hid in the hedges, we were standing in dirt with wet feet. Leaving my neighbor's property, I tracked just enough dirty mud footprints across the small paved road that separated our houses, and it was obvious the footprints led directly to my door. Oh man. Imagine winding up in juvie and explaining that's what you did to get there. So here I was, busted and stuffed again for something pretty dumb. I didn't rat on my friends, so I was the only one that got in trouble. Ah, another over-the-edge moment. You go, rebel. The pipes were returned to the lumberyard, and I was forbidden to ever step on my neighbor's property again. Like the wallet incident with the same police officer, the folks at the lumberyard agreed to let me work off the damage done instead of pressing charges. There was no arguing with this one. We did actually steal the pipes, regardless of how stupid it was, and I guess I could go to court for it. Now looking back, I'm sure it was the officer who would say, hey, you can press charges, it's a dumb juvenile thing, or you can get something out of him, some free labor, and he might actually regret what he did. My hat's off to him. So I went to work at the lumberyard for two weeks, I did whatever I was told to do, mostly outside. It was cold as hell, stacking this, moving that. The tables were turned on me, however. While I was working for the lumber yard, I would see the kids at my old bus stop boarding the bus in the morning and being dropped off in the afternoon. They could equally see the lumber yard from the bus stop and could see me also, some of them watching what I was doing. Remember the part about them being the fools? I guess I ate my words on that one. I remember hoping they would think that I actually worked for the lumber yard now that I knew what I was doing like a real grown-up and making money. During my time at the lumber yard, the owners became increasingly more friendly toward me every day. They began talking to me a little more and offering me one soda a day. They started to like me. They asked about myself, about school, what I did with myself. 
I didn't have many answers other than I don't go to school and I don't have a job. Not that I was looking for one. When the two weeks were up, I was standing alongside the train tracks where my puppy love girlfriend Donna at the time would come to check up on me after my day at the lumberyard. As we stood there along the train tracks, it was sunset. She asked me how it had been going and congratulated me on finishing my last day. She was the only one who seemed to give a shit, and I have to admit, it was kind of nice. During our puppy love moment, the owner of the lumber yard shouted across the street to me, Hey Fred, can you come back on Monday? From now on you get paid. I shouted back, Okay, thanks, I'll see you then. Donna gave me a kiss like she was actually proud of me. This was kind of new, and I liked it. But when Monday morning rolled around, I rolled over and slapped that alarm clock clean out of the ballpark and went back to sleep. I never went back to the lumber yard. I guess I was only interested in non-paying gigs. We did an incredible amount of wrong and dangerous things that slowly progressed into becoming more wrong and dangerous to others as well. In the summer, we had a lot of pretty harmless fun, like pool hopping. Once we had our swim, it was almost traditional that one of us would jump in with a big splash, shouting out loud something stupid before we all ran away. We also went garden picking in the middle of the night, standing in the dark eating someone's vegetables as if we were escaped convicts on the run. I'm sure that sooner or later when the owner came out to check on the garden, they saw our footprints and realized it wasn't a groundhog. For some reason, we threw rocks at people's houses. We would also steal entire strings of Christmas lights with the big old-fashioned bulbs. We would unscrew all of the bulbs and have an arsenal of bulbs to throw at a house, a car, whatever. We loved those big Christmas bulbs because they made a distinct popping sound when they broke. Another really dumb thing we did was leaf pile chicken. It was a dangerous game. In the fall, we would gather up a ton of leaves, make a pile in the street that spread across the whole street curb to curb. So when a car came, it had to go through the leaves. Once the full pile was laid across the street, you got down in the leaves and someone else would finish covering you up. Now when a car came down the street, the idea was to see how long you could stay buried under the pile while the car kept coming at you, before chickening out and running, or get run over. This wasn't just dumb, it was completely suicidal. Another thing we did in the fall was to steal some pumpkins off of porches and head on down to the bridge. The bridge that the train crossed over Main Street. We would carry one or two pumpkins up to the bridge and wait for a car to come. Of course, when the car drove under the bridge, we dropped the pumpkins on top of the moving vehicle. More often than not, we would hit the target. I'm sure we caused a lot of damage, and sometimes a car would come to a screeching halt and the driver would get out and come after us. I think that's actually what we were after. We got some kind of rush out of it. Now we could have easily hurt or killed someone, and it wasn't funny. Now when the fall turned to winter and all the pumpkins were gone, we turned to throwing snowballs off the bridge. Someone had called the police on us. The police actually got tricky and snuck up on us in the brush. The cops jumped up out of the brush, flashlights on us. Freeze, Hampton Police. Freeze, huh? Sorry, Charlie. The word freeze wasn't in our manual. We were gone. We could run like deer, and we knew every nook and cranny, every tree, every path along those train tracks. Their flashlights were tiny distant specks in the distance in about .01 seconds. But we wouldn't give up. We would only return later or another night to do the same thing. We would sometimes roll up snowballs on the ground big enough to be the bottom piece of a snowman. It would take two of us to lift it up on the edge of the bridge. Now we're talking lethal. And I'm sure if someone was hurt or killed, we could have been charged with homicide or attempted. Something as big as a pumpkin or a giant snowball could easily go through someone's windshield, landing directly on the driver. Eventually one did, and it was my windshield. I knew the rest of the gang was up there on the bridge, dropping giant snowballs, and I drove my car right under the bridge, and I wasn't spared. It was kind of like a little game of cat and mouse. They dropped the biggest one ever, and it landed right in the driver's side of the windshield. It caved in my windshield, snow and glass, all on my lap. For the most part, the windshield didn't completely cave in on me, thanks to the membrane in the glass. Yeah, I was pissed, but what could I say? And I got what I deserved. I'm glad it happened to me before it happened to someone else. It could have very well been karma or divine intervention, sparing someone else the damage or being hurt. Either way, it was one of those things that needed to happen, and I'm glad it did. That was my first car, the Buick Opal. Afterwards, I drove it where I needed to go with the windshield caved in. I couldn't really see out of my side of the windshield, and it was too cold to look out the door window. So I always did the pimp lean over toward the passenger side when I drove it. I wound up selling the Opal to someone for $25, who eventually flipped it upside down along the train tracks and abandoned it. But before I had my first car, most of us had been doing plenty of cruising through the art of joyriding. Once we discovered joyriding, we were hooked on getting our hands on whatever would start. Conrad and myself would usually be the ringleaders of this one. We both took turns sneaking into our mother's bedrooms late at night, 
getting into that pocketbook and getting our hands on those keys. Conrad's mom had an old gremlin, and we put a lot of miles on it. My mother had an old Plymouth Volari, which we stole frequently, but it made us nervous, because it always had a thumping sound coming from somewhere around the drive shaft of the transfer case. And we didn't want to get stranded somewhere far in the middle of the night when we would have been busted for sure. Soon the Volari kicked for good, and my mother now had an old Mercury Comet. Not a bad little car at all, and it was all in one piece. Another car I'd actually still like to have today. We couldn't get enough, and we joy rode all the time, everywhere. Eventually, I got my hands on my mother's car keys and had a duplicate made. No more sneaking around. Just get in and go. We were free as birds. It was like breaking out. One of our favorite destinations was Johnny's Truck Stop on the outskirts of Clinton, New Jersey. One reason, I'm sure, it was probably the only place open that late at night or early morning so we could get gas. If we had a few bucks between us, we were in good shape to replace at least some of the gas that we burned up, keeping us from getting caught. If we didn't have any money, we just didn't go that far. The main objective was to get the hell out of town fast, to places where there was actual traffic so we could blend in. If the Hampton cop spotted us cruising in town at 3 in the morning, we would have been caught on the spot for sure. And I guess it worked out, because during our many, many joy rides, we were never pulled over, not once. One afternoon, I woke up and walked out to my driveway, and my brother Brian was there. He was really pissed at me that we had gone joyriding the night before and didn't wake him up to come with us. He just wouldn't shut up about it, so I grabbed a quart of oil and threw it at him as hard as I could. He ducked out of the way, and the quart of oil exploded all over the Mercury Comet. The car wasn't washed ever, so the paint finish was chalky and sun-faded, causing the motor oil splats to stick out like a sore thumb. And it was all over the driver's side window. We just stood there looking at it. Oh, shit. Brian got on his bike and casually rode away, as if to say, oh, well, for you. I got a couple of rags and wiped all the oil off the window and used some glass cleaner. It was a real mess. It was easy to see that the oil actually made the paint look better compared to the chalky finish, so I wiped down the entire car, top to bottom, in motor oil. After I dry ragged the excess off, it looked great. My mother came out not long after and noticed it looked good and asked if we had cleaned it. Yep, I did. Just needed something to do, I guess. Yeah, and I guess it'll look nice for our next joyride.